Good afternoon. I am Ariana Cohen Halberstam. I am the artistic director of Boston Jewish Film. Welcome to the last day of our 32nd annual Boston Jewish Film Festival and to the last day of our first ever virtual film festival. It's been wonderful spending these two weeks with you. Uh, we are so glad to be here today to discuss Unchained Matir Agunot. I know many of you have spent the week binging. Um, I really wanna thank our sponsors of today's program, the Hadassah Brandeis Institute and the Schusterman Center for Israel Studies at Brandeis. And thank you also to the Brandeis Alumni Association and to the Brandeis Hillel. I hope you will also join us at 1.30 today for a conversation with Eitan Fox about his new film, Sublet. And at 5 p.m. as we say goodbye to the festival with a, a cocktail making class. Uh, that will, that's a free program that you can register for at our website. It is now my great pleasure to welcome the, uh, di the director and creator of Matir Gunot, Tamar Kay. Tamar is a three-time Israeli Academy Award nominee. Her thesis film, The Mute's House, was shortlisted for the 2017 Best Short Documentary Academy Award at the Oscars. And we invited her here to Boston with that film back in 2017, so it's great to have you back virtually. Um, Tamar also edited the TV series Arik Einstein, a standard love song, which won the Israeli Emmy for Best Documentary in 2018. Thank you for being with us, Tamar. Thank you. Thank you for having us. I'm also glad to uh, welcome Abigail Kovari, who is a singer, songwriter, and actress. You will recognize her immediately. She is the lead in and Matira Gunot. She has completed three albums with her band Kovari and has performed in several Israeli films, including the leading role in Red Cow, for which she won the Best Actress Award from the Jerusalem Cinematheque and which screened at the Boston Jewish Film Festival back in 2018. She was born in Jerusalem to modern Orthodox parents who moved to Israel from New York. Thank you, Abigail, for being here. Yeah. And we, we've seen you in multiple films. You were also in Redemption, which was our closing night film a few years ago. So great to have you here. And uh, Dr. Lisa Fishbane Jaffe, who is the Shulamit Reinhardt's director of the Dasa Brandeis Institute at Brandeis University. She is also the director of the Project on Gender, Culture, Religion, and the Law, a research initiative that explores the tension between women's rights and religious laws. And Dr. Jaffe is the co-founder of the Boston Aguna Task Force devoted to research, education, and advocacy for women under Jewish family law. Hello, Lisa, thank you for being here. Great to be here, thank you. So there's so much to talk about in this series. Um, I was just saying, you know, I think this conversation can go in 20 different directions and we'd still have another 20 to go in. So uh, let's start at the very beginning. Uh, Tamar, can you talk a little bit about your inspiration for this series? What drew you to this? Um, what, what, what did you start with and what sort of came as the show started to be developed. Yeah, so first of all, thanks again for having us. It's really wonderful. I miss film festivals and working on television and cinema and talking about it, so it's great. Um, so I will mention, first of all, that I'm one of the creators and um, I had the really honor and privilege working with Yossi Madmoni, who's the director of Redemption, and David Ofek. Um, they're very well-known writers and, and directors in Israel. They work both for television and cinema. And um, this is a story that originated, I think, in 2000, many years ago, 2003. They had like this idea of, of dealing with the issue of Agunot and with this rabbi who's like this half detective, half rabbi, who wants to kind of help these women uh, get their, their get and actually be free. And um, when I joined the crew, uh, one of the first things we were working on was actually uh, Avigail's character, Hanke, Hana. She had a very different kind of um, role and also path, and um, and together we were thinking um, about, you know, the place that this character will be and how she also will reflect on the, the theme of of women in religious world and you know having um, you know issues with faith and religious crisis and stuff. And I can say just as an, an anecdote that as a teenager in Jerusalem, I watched a documentary about this topic of agunot. I was um, raised in a modern Orthodox. Um, background like a big guide in Jerusalem and I remember it really shocked me it shocked me also just to be you know aware of this phenomenon that I was not unaware of and also it shocked me uh, regarding the power of cinema I saw how I was like you know brought to thoughts and and wanted to do something and go to action 
And I find it kind of interesting that I find myself my first um, major project in television um, as a director and uh, involved in writing, you know, dealing with this topic. As a teenager, teenager, I was so, you know, upset of and, and interested in diving into it. I uh, can't hear you. Interesting. Were you approached then with, um, with, with this idea or did, you, did it sort of come, come to fruition through conversation with David and, and your team? Yeah, so in the beginning, I was more working with DOC. Um, um, David kind of joined us when we were starting to work on um, directing. Um, so yeah, so DOC had this you know, idea of, of wanting to tell stories of Agunot. And then, of course, we met also Agunot and spoke with them, but also with women who maybe Lisa could also talk about that, but uh, organizations that assist uh, women. I'm going to close the door one sec. Zoom in 2002. Um, so we started building you know, the characters of the Agunot, and it was very important for us. Um, we can also talk about the differences between Israel and the rest of the world, I guess, in that sense. But uh, yeah. we wanted to have a kind of a diversity to it because it is a, di it is a very, um, unfortunately, phenomenon that, that can happen to different women and different backgrounds in the Israeli society. Um, and as I said, I had a lot of fun working on Avigail's character, on Hana, um, writing her from from scratch, scrap, you say? How do you say to write something? From scratch, from, yeah. Yeah, from scratch. Yeah. Um, and I also think, I mean, I come from a very different background. My story is very different. My relationship with the religious world is very different. But I could also identify myself in a way in places and dilemmas that she was dealing with. Um, and that was also very interesting and very uh, heartwarming. I mean, I can talk about it maybe later, but all the people that participated in the scenes of the ultra religious people that are they're called in Hebrew anusim, those people that kind of live a double life. They're all people that come from the back religious background and themselves lived a, you know, a, a while as anusim. Yeah, the character developments are all really interesting. And I do think, um, I, I would like to talk more later about how you sort of came up with who needs to be represented in terms of the agunot. Um, but I, I would love to ask you, Abigail, you know, Hannah is such a rich character and, and what drew you to her and how did you sort of work on, on developing her? Um, so also, thank you so much for having this event. I'm really excited. It's really nice to talk about art and about Mithira Gunot and I'm wearing my fancy socks and boots, <laughs> I promise. <laughs> um, what drew me, I think I got I was called for an audition and I got a dialogue, uh, a monologue of Hanke that she, she's speaking in episode nine, I think, where she starts to talk to the camera and like um, has all of her confessions that she does in her forum in the internet. And um, I just read the monologue and the words were so powerful that it, it just struck me. I, I, was, I was tearing like immediately and I also, I come from a religious background, not at all the same, but very much felt like deep, deep, similar feelings. So like there was a really personal connection at first and it was just like an amazing story, an important story to tell. And it was written amazingly and uh, yeah. <laughs> Lisa, as someone who, who does a lot of work on with um, Agunot here in the U.S. and also studying, um, what were your impressions of the show and, and what sort of representation um, did you see in the show that you felt like you might have not seen before? Or where did, where did, you, where did you see this sort of differing from your um, experience with Agunot in the U.S.? Well, I, th I think the, the show is, is wonderful and it's a tremendous contribution towards raising consciousness about the problem of get-based extortion and get refusal, um, both in Israel and around the world. And I really commend um, Tamar and her colleagues for, for bringing that to life. Um, in terms of uh, the show itself, I, as, as I watched it, I was sort of challenged. Initially, I, I saw Yosef as a hero and, and then as we got deeper into the story, I, that I, I was challenged in thinking about how heroic is he really? Um, because there were so many hypocrisies and compromises and um, misleading himself and others that he engaged in in order to do this work. 
Um, and I actually reached out to some colleagues who are um, Aguna advocates in, in Israel to get their sense as well. And they, they again, really valued the, the work, um, but also really valued the point that it makes that uh, what these um, men in the rabbinate are doing to try and help in extreme cases isn't really getting at the fundamental issue, which is this is a problem of systemic inequality um, that is perpetuated by this archaic system. And, and I, I really loved that at the beginning of each episode, um, there is a, a little uh, explanation about how archaic the system is. Um, and what, what Yosef and people like him are doing is just kind of nibbling around the edges of this um, systemic inequality and, and keeping an unfair system ticking over. Um, you asked a bit about the difference between Israel and uh, the U.S. and the rest of the world. The main difference is that in Israel, halakha, Jewish law, is the law of the land. There is no civil marriage and civil divorce. Uh, whereas in America, you have to choose to be subject to Jewish law. And if you want to walk away from it, you can do that. Um, in Israel, and as you, you saw in the many characters that Tamar uses, uh, who are clients in the rabbinical court, many of them are not particularly religious, they're not particularly orthodox, but they have no choice. Um, so that's a key difference, that it catches everyone in Israel, whereas in America, the Aguna problem catches people who are committed to uh, having religious status and um, who, who want to ensure that they can remarry um, in orthodoxy. I think the other important distinction here is the kind of things that Yosef does in Israel um, like using brute force to, uh, to force someone to deliver a get, those are illegal in America. And you, you do federal time if you <laughs> engage in that kind of conduct. There was a, a well-known case a few years ago involving Mendel Epstein, who was a rabbi in New York. Um, and for a price, quite a significant price, for about $50,000, he would take a recalcitrant husband to New Jersey um, and have them beaten up. Uh, he actually came to be called in, in the popular press the prod father because he used cattle prods to persuade men to deliver a get. Um, but that doesn't fly in, in America, and, and he's in federal prison along with his colleagues for about 10 years now. So those are some key differences to start with. I will, I will also add like an ironic aspect to it that also if people choose not to get married um, in Israel through the religious court, as you said, that we don't have an option of civil marriage, Many people go to places like Cyprus, they get married there, but the ironic situation is that when they come back to Israel and they wanna be you know, recognized as married, if they wanna get divorced uh, in the future, they still have to go through the rabbinical court. Okay. So even, even if you, you know, avoid it in the wedding stage, if you wanna divorce, um, you have to go through it. Wow, there's a, there's a comment here from Shana Weiss from the Schusterman Center. Um, who said that she learned that there's a TV series on the prod, uh, prod father and development on American TV. So maybe we can have you on a panel together in the future about that show. Um, is, is it legal in Israel? I mean, do, had you heard about these? Is this where this came from? Or, or did you sort of make up the character of Yosef? So first of all, there is someone in Jerusalem, one person in Israel that works on tries to, you know, in different and original or less original ways, trying to convince these men to grant a divorce. Um, and they also go abroad, this, he and his unit sometimes go abroad and do all these like, you know, uh, rescue or you know, all these like um, heroic um, trips, whatever. Of course, this is a, a fictional uh, character. And I will say that, that we try to have these, um, you know, these aspects of this person sometimes being violent and something that um, is true to this character and not saying that the system is uh, is, you know, uh, supporting that. Um, we can, I can say that like in our research in general, also not only in Israel, but abroad, and, and as a story you mentioned, Lisa, we did hear about uh, these situations as well of using, you know, power. Uh, but it was not, we were not trying to say that this is like the way the, um, it works in Israel. Um, but I will say that, you know, part of the reason we decided to kind of portray this character is trying to I don't know if to encourage also this aspect um, in the rabbinical, not, not the violence, but the, the fact that there is someone that is motivated and cares and wants to kind of help, um, trying to, to ask ourselves, what if, you know, what if we had a rabbinical court that was much more into helping these women? Because I can say, you know, as, as Tamar, personal, you know, private person, I'd love us to have um, the option of civil marriage in Israel. 
but unfortunately I also know where I live and I know how the dynamics of politics and religion in Israel are extremely complicated. Um, and it's true to different aspects of the Israeli politics and policy, not only, not only to the, you know, who's, who's in charge of these uh, fields. So I, in, at the same time, I think there's also uh, importance in trying to challenging the rabbinical court and, and being more pro, I don't know if to call it pro woman, but more uh, active in helping these, uh, these women. Sorry, there's some feedback, so I keep muting myself. Um, but there's, 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 um, you touch on different ways that there are organizations that are going about helping these women, and right. there's, there's an episode that has, I think, the organization is Locked Doors, is that, right. uh, and there's this moment of tension between um, Yosef and the representative from Locked Doors. Can you talk about that? And I know. There are similar organizations in the U.S. that maybe Lisa can talk about as well. But will you talk about that scene and what what your intentions were there? So there's a very well known. There's a few organizations in, in Israel, and they have also different um, agendas towards the rabbinical court and and how they want to cooperate with them or not. But I, I'd say the most radical are, are um, they're called Mavoy Satum uh, Dead End, which is part of the reason we decided to call it like a closed door, kind of trying to hint to them um, and. And you know the women that work there are, are talmidot chachamim. You know they're the women that that know um, not less well than the rabbis and stuff. Um, and um, so we try to show this tension. We try to show that there is uh, women trying to work and and doing also a great job. But in a way, it also kind of was something that I think for our hero was something that you know in a way he sees as as. Um, as a competition to what he does. Uh, and I think it, it, from what I read about the real rabbi, who of course we wrote in the beginning of each episode that there's no connection, but you know, as from what we read, I think that there was, he was he had a lot of also like pride of, you know, his successful stories. Um, so I'm, I'm, you know, I want um, those organizations to have more and more uh, success stories as well that like also the Agnot, um, um, people in the, rabbinical, in the rabbinical court to kind of be more successful and useful in what they do. Yeah. Lisa, can you speak a little bit about what these organizations' missions are and how they work here versus Israel as well? Yeah, and I, and I was really struck by that, that scene with Rivka Miriam from, from Locked Door. Um, it, it was clear that there was a turf war you know, that, that Yosef says, you know, I know things that a female rabbinical pleader just doesn't know. Um, and, you know, and the remedies that, that Rivka Miriam is proposing, like, let's get an exit order so the guy can't leave the country until he gives the get. He says, oh, no, we don't do that. That undermines the rabbinate. And then later in the show, he does that. Um, uh, so it, it, there's, there's a certain amount of um, defending his turf and defending his legitimacy against these learned uh, women. Um, what I also liked about that representation that it also talked about uh, the additional role that they play, that the rabbinical court is a, a place of real pain for women. And I, you know, I, there, there was a resonance between many scenes that uh, were in the show of women in the, in the court just screaming, just saying, I can't stand this. Um, and uh, you know, like, set me free. And I, that, that I imagine was shaped in part by documentaries. There was a documentary uh, based in the rabbinical courts that came out maybe 10 years ago called Nekudeshets. That's, uh, that, that was more like 20 years ago. That was the movie I was talking about earlier. Oh, ah, right, right. Yeah. Which, which like took a, um, undercover tapes into the rhythmical courts and it, it featured women screaming like this because they, they just couldn't have their voices heard. Um, so part of what these, these Toanot, these female rabbinical pleaders do are um, listen to these women's voices um, and also offer them the kind of emotional support that is not available elsewhere in the rabbinical court process. And that, that's something that happens in America as well. Um, for example, I'm, I'm involved with the Boston Aguna Task Force, which provides uh, accompaniment to women who are going through rabbinical courts because th there are no female judges, no female dayanim. Um, but it, it makes a big difference to have uh, a woman who uh, will accompany uh, the woman going through the process, explain the process, um, and help to uh, have to work out an effective uh, resolution. Yeah. 
And, and I also admit that they, in Israel, I know that they also act in a way like lawyers, you know, they, 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 they will go into like arguments and they'll try to say, no, but you can use this tool or that tool. Um, and also just to say, like, like you said, Lisa, yes, this is uh, the idea of having this, you know, woman screaming in the background was something that we started in the first episode already, because I think also something that's really important to know or imagine is that it's a very, uh, you know, it's a world of men and not only men, but ultra religious men uh, in each court. Uh, and also just like in the building, you know, all the people that work there. So I think that there's even um, so much um, beauty in what they do and just being there. Um, yeah, it changes the culture. Exactly. Yeah. I think there's the the theme of women's voices sort of being hidden comes up a few times in your in your show. I think we see these scenes where Yosef is speaking to his father-in-law about Hanka's um, you know conception and going to the mikvah and uh, where she's not really given the, her own voice until I think it's the third or fourth episode where she becomes, where it's all about her and the show really shifts there. Um, was that a conscious choice and sort of, I'm also really curious if you can talk about that episode as well, Abigail, of what it was like um, to, to do that episode where suddenly you were hinting at this internal life that we were about to learn a lot about in the upcoming episodes. Um, I think also with what you were talking about before that like it's a world of men I think this like this is my interpretation also of the series itself but Unchained talks about so many different cases of women and also about Hanke and and yet the the series has a male hero and I think that like ironically also says something about it like there, there's so many women around Yosef struggling and having this mm -hmm. dramatic story and, and a voice that they need to tell. But in the end, it's like, it, it's around him. And um, it's like something that happens a lot in our world. So in that point, but um, in the fourth episode, can you uh, remind yeah, me? Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I wanna, I wanna, that's a really interesting point. And was that something that, you know, was, was a point of conversation um, you know, even I was thinking all of the synopses I, I see and even ours on our website is, is it leads with Rabbi Yosef Mora and, and not, and not with Hanke, who's really um, also a, you know, one of the stars of the show. And, and was, were you, were you thinking about that when you were framing the series? I think, I think it's probably, an important point. I think well, something that interesting that happened while we were writing the characters that first of all we fell in love uh, with Khan even before Abigail entered and when she entered it was like you know we're completely in love but we, we were falling in love with her character and her story and her struggle and in a way I think as you said the series kind of shifted to a story about um, a couple in a relationship and I think one of the challenging things about writing a synopsis or treatment is is also not revealing the secret because there is an aspect of a secret that you suddenly understand there's something with this character we're not sure what her story is and only i think towards the the last third of the of the series you really understand the 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 the, the you know the mental place she's at and and the struggles she's dealing with and the world she she she'd like to you know maybe escape so that was also part of our reason trying to kind of give the hint or you know the the, the, um, the process we go through as viewers um, also in that treatment, but yeah, it was also part of, you know, it, it, it's, uh, each story can have so many different point of views, of course, but we found that it's actually interesting and challenging to go uh, through this male character and also challenging him, uh, confusing him, because he's someone that not like his wife loves the religious world and, and law and it, it gives him comfort, but, you know, I think that he gets confused as he goes through this process and, and gets to know these women. Um, and, and I, and I do feel that like at the end, um, I think many people also after watching all the episodes are much more, um, drawn by Hanke's story and her process. Um, so that was something that was, was initial. I mean, I'd, I'd actually love to have her secret being revealed a bit earlier, but it's also questions of drama and stuff, but that was part of the reason that we were thinking of having early on an episode that suddenly will have like, it's kind of off, off shift. There's no agunot, it's a different kind of story. Uh, it's kind of an, an afternoon with Hanke. What if, you know, what if I just go out of the house right now and get into this car right now and, and 
go on this journey? Is it possible to kind of just cut our lives? Um, yeah, and it's an interesting episode sort of in contrast with the episode in Ukraine, um, right. which is more about Yosef and the way he talks about Rav Nachman, you know, is, you know, the, the ideas of sort of these, these boundaries, and I think boundaries plays a role throughout the series, um, you know, what, what are they, is he allowed to eat that fruit that was given to him on Shabbat? Mm -hmm. Is she allowed to get in the car and how far can she go while pushing the boundary? And I was interested from the very beginning, we see these kosher, these non-kosher cell phones. Um, and I, there's the scene also where um, Yosef holds Anka's hands when she's in Nida, but is, is still quoting halakha, Jewish law. Um, so he won't fully give into it. Um, I, I, I'm interested in sort of how you were thinking about boundaries and religion. Um, there's a line also where somebody says, most secular people are secretly religious. Uh, can you talk a bit about like what you wanted to get across um, about these lines between religion and the secular world. Yeah, so I think boundaries is, is indeed, uh, by the way, Abigail, did you want to uh, add something earlier? Well, never mind, it's fine. <laughs> um, boundaries, it, it, boundaries is, is, is something that is very strong um, throughout the, um, the journey. And I think it's also part of what, you know, I think for many religious people and Yosef as a, maybe a representative of them, the boundaries of the religious world um, give the, uh, its believers is, is something, a source of comfort. And, and uh, I think that for Hanke and maybe for many women, those boundaries are um, lim limitations and, and, you know, kind of avoiding, uh, full, full, you know, fulfilling yourselves. Um, so that was, that was one aspect of it, of, of, you know, kind of wanting to work on these boundaries. And also I think that in Israel, on one hand, the boundaries are, are clear and there's a lot of tension between the world, but, but the, you know, the older I get, I, I learn how, how these boundaries are fictional, almost I'd say. Uh, I, I, I think that just as they say that all the religious, many secular people are actually, you know, Yom Kippur arrives and whatever, and, and deep inside they do have this kind of religious or Jewish light. But on the other, on the contrary, many, many ultra religious people have huge uh, curiosity, curiosity and also knowledge um, about the secular world or about the more liberal world. Uh, I can even think about many ultra-religious people that watch the series that were upset of, by the series or that were, you know, if, if you're upset by it, it means that you sat and watched it. And, you know, you, so that's also a question of where is your boundary? And of course the internet is, is a big challenge for, for the religious world, I think. We have a lot of questions coming in from the <laughs> audience. So I'll, I'll start to get to a few of them. Um, and the first one is for Abigail. It says, each of your roles is so powerful as a religious woman who feels trapped by her circumstances and exploring life on the margins. This is also true in your role in Red Cow. Have you chosen these roles intentionally or is it just a lucky coincidence? And then thank you for your amazing performances. Thank you. <laughs> um, thanks a lot. I was lucky enough to be offered these uh, roles and to feel very close to it. I mean, also, I mean, I was a bit typecast. Uh, uh, most of the roles I did in acting was of religious because I, I think I feel it very much. So it was just intuitive for me. Um. <laughs> yeah, well, um, well, we'd love to see you in more of these roles and also in others. There's a question here about, um, about how this works with the rabbinical courts in Israel. And this is um, is the is most of the population in Israel secular? How is it possible for the rabbinical court to? I, this is a big question to have ultimate control. Are the cases that can be heard by the Israeli Supreme Court? Is there a secular Supreme Court? Um, so, can you talk a little bit about how the rabbinical court? Um, any of you can talk about this about how the rabbinical court plays into um, things like marriage, divorce um, in Israel. I, I, my knowledge is, I think, less than Lisa. I can just say that I think that it, it is like an, just an example of something wider. I think that the fact that um, the religious or ultra religious uh, population has a lot of um, power is because in almost each coalition, uh, whoever is in the, the lead needs the ultra religious voice to go with them. So they say, okay, we'll go with them, but you give me ABC. I want to be in charge of ABC. 
Um, and I think there is also, I don't know if logic, but I can understand that in a way their logic that they want, you know, they're so scared of, um, how do you say, what it looks? Um, yeah. I remember that, <laughs> God, horrible. Uh, but they're so scared of, you know, uh, intermarriage, well, it happens especially in the, outside of Israel, but they're so, it's so important for them to know exactly who's Jewish and who's mother and this and that. So it's something that they decided, you know, they want to have the power of over. Uh, there is a secular um, court, but it's it's a separated. Uh, we don't have the separation between uh, law and religion in Israel. But I'm sure Lisa can. Uh, well, I just I, that, that's completely accurate. I would just add that um, the modern state of Israel has continued the. Oh, Lisa, you're breaking up. Um, personal law based on the religious community you are connected to. So if you are um, Muslim, you marry and divorce under Muslim law. If you're Jewish, you marry and divorce under Jewish law. There are different um, Christian confessional uh, regimes as well, but there is no um, civil marriage and divorce. There is a parallel civil family law system and uh, that deals with everything but marriage and divorce. So it'll deal with questions like custody and dividing up property and child support. Um, but it's uh, up to the couple to decide which system they wanna go to. And often it can be uh, what people call a, a race to the courthouse. So wherever you open the file, that's where they'll have control of the case. And uh, women are much better off dealing with questions of property and finance and child support in the civil courts than they are in the religious courts. So part of what uh, these women's uh, advocacy, advocacy groups in Israel advise people to do is get your case into the civil courts as soon as possible so that the involvement of the rabbinical court can be as small as possible in resolving mm -hmm. your marriage. I was interested, speaking of, you know, sort of the ways we go, they go about getting the guests um, prioritized, there was, can you talk about sort of in the we see in the series many people who are saying I'm pregnant and this issue of of mamzer mamzerim or bastards um, and how that sort of prioritizes certain cases and that seems like it's driven more by the religious court instead of the secular court. Can you talk a little bit about that and how that's used and what that fear is and and what the sort of yeah, so I think of this, it's, it comes from the same uh, idea that like we, we want to have as many Jews as, as possible and want to have control of this. We don't want to op open too many options. And there comes the idea of, of, of bastard mamzer, that there's a lot of uh, implications and uh, consequences if someone is a mamzer. So that's suddenly something that kind of scares the rabbinical court. Uh, we use it like in a half lie. She uses this, you know, the Gunan, our, our character. And by the way, that's a story that we heard that actually happened. Uh, this woman that was kind of, uh, you know, just saying that she's pregnant just to kind of uh, help um, her chances of getting the, the get. Um, yeah. Just want to say that um, it's like a shame how women in the, that, that the, tr the Jewish tradition is important for them. They, they have to battle between two important identities that it's their feminine identity and their their connection to the tradition and it's always they, they need to like think in these kind of moments what's more important for me I could say that also I'm I'm engaged and I want to get married and it's important for me to do it in the Jew Jewish law but I feel very um commit committed to like my feminism and the and the equality I want to um to go forth how do you say <laughs> so yeah. it's it's so also in those scenes you see how Women's need, women need to like do all these like under the belt kind of sneaky moves because they're just protecting their, their right to be a free woman and to get like equal opportunities. And it has to, it has to nece like it necessary be um, uh, al cheshbon, how do you say? Um, like an yeah. equation. The, the price they pay is is as if their Jewish um, respect, they like their respect to the Jewish law, and it's just, it's just sad, and it's a shame. And I think it's, it's good that this series like shows this this um, struggle, because also with Hanke, with, with she she wants to be in the Haredi, like by the book. She she just she wants everything to be okay, but, but.
but it's hard for her when Yosef doesn't touch her and he can't hug her and she needs him in some emotional moments and it's just a it's a it's a big conflict yeah yeah that ties really interestingly into one of the questions we have from the audience which is the contrast between Yosef's ability to talk intimately to the various Azunot while at the same time not really listening to Hanke is extremely interesting was that intentional uh, yeah, so that, of course, was intentional. Uh, I think in many places in our lives, it's easier maybe to be outside much more open and liberal or whatever. And then suddenly when it comes to your own home and, and your own, um, you know, family members, you suddenly find it more difficult. Uh, but yeah, it was part of, there's a lot of, I think, you know, also dealing with the question of truth and, and false. That's also like another theme that kind of goes through um, the, as I think you said, Lisa, sometimes, you know, using all these not so kosher, cool ways, lying and manipulating to get this get. What what does that mean about you know the action itself? Um, so that was of course uh, um, something that we were thinking of, and I think that also Yosef, while he's working in his uh, workplace and he feels successful, he's in a way justifying you know the world he's in. He's like, yeah, you know, but there's people like me, and and we want to help, and we're pro. Although we see that people around him see him as like this persona non grata. They don't like his action. He's like, you know. And then when he comes home, suddenly it struck him that the person who's closest to him that he also loves, that, that are challenging, you know, they are challenging um, getting pregnant and stuff. Suddenly she's dealing with these issues and it's much harder. Uh, I think that Hanke challenges him more. I think that the questions she asks are, are also um, questions that somewhere deep inside he also asks. You were talking, earlier about borders, but I think he's also a character that's always playing, you know, kind of in a liminal area, you know, he meets this uh, secular uh, investor, who, an investigator who helps, helps him. It'll be in a secular place, so he's going to dress up like a secular, you know, he's going to, but he's also in a way attracted to those worlds. Um, so that's, that's why the challenge is much bigger. Yeah. Well, and, and I think we see all the characters sort of playing with their own lines there. So that's that's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, we were talking earlier about um, about the show Unorthodox. And I think this idea that, you know, every th one of the things that I think your show exhibits is there are many different personalities and there are many different approaches to religion, to relationships. And that's that's true across across yeah. denominations, across homes. So, um, so okay, there's a question here about uh, the word anusim, uh, which is, they say, from the same root as the word rape um, in Hebrew. And in the last episode we learned, well, we learned about a rape was, I, I know some people haven't finished the series. So if you, <laughs> um, I'll, I'll try to give, I'll try to give spoiler alerts uh, when, when possible. Uh, is there a conscious attempt to link these two ideas and narratives through the term? Yeah. So first, so first of all, uh, in a way, yeah. Um, I'll tr there's there's a historical also um, uh, context to the world and Usim, and I hope I'll be able to kind of accurately in English uh, explain the story. But basically, in Spain, when uh, and I think it was in the 13th um, century, uh, when Jews were um, forced to convert, um, many people, you know, just to stay in lives so-called converted, but inside they stayed Jewish and they, they call themselves Anusim. It, it comes from, you know, from the, from the world on it, from, uh, they, they were forced to, Anus, I'm, I'm forced to do something. So they were kind of keeping their religious identity as um, hide, you know, they'd uh, have like uh, Shabbat candles, etc. keep kosher, but it was also, always inside. So in a way, and, and that's in, in the real world, that's like the phenomena of, um, of uh, ultra-religious people that kind of live a double life these days they took that name but they they kind of switched the 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 idea that they're kind of hiding their secular identity their secular world um and showing themselves as if they're um jewish so that's first of all the, the origin from it and where it comes from and also in a way i'd say that also Hanke, she went through what she went um as she confessed in the last episode but she also is in a way forced to be uh, in a world and in a role that she might not find it the, the accurate uh, place for her. Yeah, um, there's another question here that sort of relates um, that also deals with the ending. So for anyone who hasn't um, who hasn't finished the show, you can we'll, we'll signal when we're you can mute us and we'll signal when <laughs> we're done talking about the end. But um, 
It says, in the end, it seemed that the challenges were reversed and that Hanke no longer had lies and was created a situation where she was unchained, whereas her husband was not living a lie. He was in was now living a lie. He was in love with another woman and that he was now chained to her. Was that the intention? Were you playing with this idea of, of who was chained to whom? Uh, yeah, we were, of course. I think that there is, um, you know, this kind of an amount of freedom that Hanke gets at the end when she finally tells her secret and kind of reveals everything. And of course, Yosef is in a way um, um, confused. I wouldn't say that he, he knows for sure that he wants to be with this new woman. Um, and I think that also the ending that Hanke suddenly, you know, discovers that she finally is pregnant is on one hand a very um, happy moment, but also in a way I think it kind of hints this, you know, what, what will the future hold for this character? Does this mean that she has to go back into the closet, you know, into the religious closet? Or does this mean that this couple is about to go to the rabbinical court, you know, as a couple that, that are, you know, divorced? That was something that we want to hint on, uh, not to have a, a clear There's a answer. question. There is a question about the end, if the series is going to go on and if we'll see what happens next to them. Yeah, so unfortunately, I don't think so. There was a will of, of having another season, but just because, you know, it was the question of create, uh, us, the creators, and being occupied by other projects, and now the COVID-19 entering. So I don't know, maybe one day, but but doesn't seem like that. But I kind of like the fact that, that the ending has this kind of open, um, open place that people can also just, you know, imagine each path and I think each path is complex like life. <laughs> There's a question here about the another question about the Anusim is it a movement and can you talk about the apartment uh, where where Hanka goes and and yeah. that community? Yeah so that's a, a fascinating uh, phenomenon that I was also uh, had yeah I guess the privilege of kind of seeing it live um, I went to a few Shabbatot Saturdays and also to one of the Chagim, the Shavuot, this, this um, um, group of people. And I think, first of all, it's a movement. You, it depends who you ask, how big it is. The people that are um, themselves, people that left the ultra-religious world will say it's pretty big. I think that in a way, every person who left the religious world, in, in, if it was a week or a year, or if a month he was a noose, you know, each person decides who wants to, I want to leave, has this, you know, kind of adjustment time, and how do I tell my family? But there are people that uh, live this double life. And I had a really fascinating conversation with this guy. He looks ultra religious, totally, you know, and, he's, and he opened his, you know, um, his uh, suit and, and he said, yeah, you see my phone on Shabbat, that's a weird thing to see, an ultra religious uh, Jew with a phone. And I was talking to him and then he said, listen, I want to leave. I don't believe in anything. But the truth is I love my wife. I just love her, you know? And I, and I love that conversation because, you know, um, it, it is a very, very complicated move to do. Nothing is waiting for them outside. It's not that it's so easy to um, enter the secular or liberal world in Israel, or I guess also in the US. And I think, I, I find it's interesting that even people that left the, the ultra religious world many times continue to li live in these kind of communities and they, they become the community of themselves and now that they suddenly is, you know totally merge into the um into the secular society or the modern orthodox and and then many times they meet in these kind of apartments that are kind of uh, either of a couple like in our series that are still in that world or people that left um and i think it's a, it's an alternative community it's a it's um, a sense of a new family. It's a place to explore, um, to understand, by the, by the way, uh, boundaries of yourself. Um, it's, it's a fascinating phenomenon. So I, I think it's, it's also growing. Um, yeah. There, there is a question that you sort of answer here, but I want to just bring up because yeah. there's a, there's a um, Karen, Shin Sh I'm sorry, Karen Skenazi says, Ayala Fader has done a done ethnographic re, uh, research on hidden heretics. She says the people she studies prefer to live double lives rather than be on their way out. Uh, the question was whether you see your Anusim in that way or if there are people that will ultimately find the inevitable path to secularism, which I think you sort of just talked about, but um, if anyone's interested in reading more about it, um, she mentions Ayala Fader. Uh, I'd love so. to, uh, if, if somehow someone can send or a link or on the chat or something, I'd love to read about that. Yeah. I have to say that towards the the filming, I was doing my research about how to really be a ultra-religious um, 
a Haredi woman and I met a few Haredi women and I told them about the story that's coming up in a series about the Anusim and they're like, no, 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 it's just rumors. It's, it's, it's make-believe. It's not really. And they were completely um, <laughs> denied the fact that it's happening. It's just like rumors that come to intimidate the Haredi community. So huh. also that <laughs> for some Interesting. people. There's, Actually, there's a, oh, go ahead. But it says a story that there's there's a song that they sing in one of the episodes that they kind of change uh, one of the worlds to Anusim. That um, and and a, a friend who's uh, helped helped us with the script and he himself was uh, Anus for a few years. He went to this wedding, and suddenly they put the song in the background. And he said that suddenly there were many people that kind of from around the you know the hall <laughs> kind of come in and started singing it, and it, it felt like this kind of um, secret language that all the people that were like really intuistic to this specific song kind of coding to each other i'm also in that world like, which, which was very interesting and also i think to me was very interesting because it means that many people also in the ultra religious world watch the show although it's obviously less kosher um interesting that's that's really interesting somebody says can we speak to the art and emotion in the show there's a beautiful there's a beauty and complexity and love in the portrayal of this relationship that to me speaks all, to all relationships. It's universal and makes the series so wonderful and it's different from what would be on American TV. Um, can you talk about the the core relationship in the film? First of all, thank you. Um, and yeah, I think that as I said, that we started falling in love with Hanke in the, care, in the, uh, in the writing process. And then of course, started when we were working with the guide, it was very important for us to have uh, in-depth and a uh, real relationship between Yosef and Hanke. Um, so we so we would portray a couple that really is struggling. And I think that, that that's true. That is, a, in a way, a universal uh, theme and challenge because even if it's not about the religious um, identity, um, there are so many um, dilemmas and so many obstacles to each uh, couple who's together for a few good years. Um, so yeah, so that in that sense, it was something that was very important to us to kind of portray the, um, a couple that we will, will, we will want them to be together as an audience that we would like like them and care for them and care for this relationship. Um, there's a question here that I think is really interesting about the power dynamics between religious men and women, the Rabbanut and secular Jews, and then also the Ashkenazi and Mizrahi Jews and about the creating the character of Yosef as Iraqi and what, um, what your intentions were with that. Yeah. So first of all, I'll say that Yossi and David, in many of their works, they're the co-creators, Yossi Madmoni and David Ofek. In many of their works, um, they, they they also deal with this tension. I think as, I think, yeah, they both come from a Mizrahi background, married to Ashkenazi women. So I guess they're also bringing their uh, personal sometimes uh, um, experiences. But yeah, that was part of the reason that we want, you know, the idea is that we had um, an issue with Hanke. Yeah, she, she you know, she's she so-called has, uh, she's damaged in a way because she has diabetes and, and you know, that's also another aspect and phenomena of, of ultra-religious world, uh, which is a very um, problematic, but like, you know, thinking about shiduchim and, and, and kind of pri prioritizing uh, the, the options. So that was part of the reason that we kind of wanted to create this relationship, that he's a, a smart guy and he's successful, but he's Iraqi. So he'll get the Ashkenazi woman with a slight damage. Now uh, we think that the damage is the, the diabetes and then we understand that there's a, a, a more complex story that touches her past. Um, yeah, I think, you know, I think the series in a way, it's also when you have like a big appetite, you kind of want to touch a lot of um, aspects. And that's also a very, very, um, I, I, I'd say in the religious world, even more than in the general society in Israel, I think that, I think that we're in a different place today, but in the religious world, there's still, big differences also because there's different minhagim um, and, and also because there's still snobbish, um, yeah, point of views. Right, of course, we see that scene where he says kiddush at um, Hanka's family's house and their, yeah. the kids are snickering and um, so we see that. Um, and I, there, we don't have much time and there are so many wonderful questions coming in, uh, but you did bring up um, Hanka's diabetes and someone asked if you could speak about the stigma of that and if that discrimination uh, she suffers contributes to her desire to leave the community. Um, Abigail, do you want to talk about that a bit or do you want me to start with the diabetes? 
Yeah, you could start. Okay, so I'll start. Um, yeah, so um, when we were thinking about what will be her so-called effect or um, I, I brought the idea of the diabetes because actually my brother um, has diabetes. He was diagnosed when he was six years old. And I, I saw how my parents, it was very important for them that he won't suffer this feeling of being different and stuff. But it's always a challenge of how much do you talk about it openly or not. I mean, if you, um, if you like deal with it openly and have no problem, will that actually make it a more of an of a, of a issue in the future? Uh, so that was the initial idea of where it came from that specific um, um, disease. But, um, but yeah, uh, it is, I think that, you know, unfortunately, when, when many um, religious couples or ultra religious couples think about their children and about their um, future shiduchim, their, you know, matching and stuff. So there is, uh, in a way, this kind of, um, uh, you know, trying to see, okay, this, his quality versus her qualities. And part of the quality is also the medical condition of the <laughs> product. But that, yeah, that was something that we wanted to kind of underline. Uh, also, it helped us, you know, in, in, for the narrative of kind of connecting Yosef and Hannah, but also it was uh, trying to hint another uh, absurdity of this world of, you know, kind of treating her as a different, uh, and, and of course, because it's a genetic, um, um, disease, so it could affect her brother and sisters, which was part of the reason the parents tried to kind of teach her to hide it. I think it's also why it's interesting that in the episode, in the fourth episode, her um, will of, you know, the what if I just leave everything has a connection to the diabetes. Uh, it's the same thing that locked her in the first place. It was the same thing that we learned later on that kind of um, allowed her to explore the different world and be aware of fact that there's un, you know secular people and stuff so that was also a reason that we wanted to connect it yeah i think it's, it's also like it's the base of from where hanke starts to develop her own world which also she feels that she's different from other people and that she can't be herself and she needs to hide and she starts being independent and it's just it like makes her uh, muscle of of being able to lie and being on her own, just bigger and bigger, and that—that's what helps the other s secrets to thrive. Um, I, I think it's interesting also that she—it's almost a ritual that she has to sort of do this medication three times a day. It's her religion, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, I do—I just want to share a comment that's coming in. I love the complexity of what's explored in this show that is universal and applied to all of us, uh, which is the essence of art. So thank you. And that's from Masha. So um, I think one of the things that um, when the when the movie Get came out um, in 2014, I believe, um, there was a lot of conversation of it being shown in rabbinical courts and talk about how that was going to change things um, with laws around Get. Um, I'm curious to hear from Lisa and Tamar and Abigail, if any of you have anything to add um, to what the effect of films like Get and the documentary you mentioned earlier have had on law and whether you think that sh ha making shows like this will ultimately have an effect. So, I mean, my sense is that, that all these, these kinds of programs do have an effect in terms of consciousness raising. And, and it was really a, a big moment when um, Mekadeshet was shown in the Knesset and uh, Get the Trial of Vivian Anselm was also shown to members of Knesset. Um, and I think it, it feeds into a process of culture change. I mean, one of the, the things that I've seen just since I've been working in this field is the the change in the vocabulary of how we talk about get refusal, that we really talk about it as a form of domestic violence. Um, and I think you can see that in the representations of the, the characters in, in Tamar's uh, series, that a lot of the men who are engaging in get refusal, I mean, it's not because they want to continue the marriage, um, it's because they want to exercise power and control over their wives. Um, into the future. And, and sometimes they don't even want anything else. They, they don't, they just want her to be unhappy and they just want to, to um, for her to be um, subject to them in the future. They, they're not trying to negotiate anything. They're not trying to get anything beyond that. So I think that's an important transformation in, in how we understand that. 
Um, and it lends itself to other new initiatives that have come forward. So um, things that I point out in Israel is, you know, the Rabbinut that's portrayed in the series is the official state-run Rabbinut, but there are alternative rabbinical courts that have been emerging that are willing to do more with Jewish law, um, take, take more risks. You know, they, they're not the little court in Ramat Gan that's worried about what the Jerusalem central guys think. You know, these are, are people who are willing to be more innovative and take action uh, for women. Um, another, another initiative that's happening around the world is the adoption of halachic prenuptial agreements, uh, which are well accepted in the modern Orthodox world in the United States and are becoming more accepted in Israel. The, the Center for Women's Justice um, has a version. Um, Rachel Levmore has written a whole book on how it's completely legitimate and has gotten many uh, ultra-Orthodox rabbis to sign off saying some version of a prenup can work. Um, so there, there are all kinds of initiatives that, that are happening, but um, there's still a ways to go. Yeah, I agree also with Lisa. And I think that also uh, when you look at um, processes that happened in Israel, as you mentioned, Mikudeshi, the wonderful documentary that was the first documentary in Israel that was dealing or any kind of form of art that was dealing with this topic. Uh, the, the Rabbanut in Israel, and I think it's also important to say, changed its way in the past 20 years. They're trying, there's a lot more to do, but they're much less stubborn and much more, um, I think, talkable. And, and, and also all these organizations, most of them started 20 years ago in the late 90s, early 2000s. And I, I do believe that there has a connection to this documentary. Um, I don't know if, I even assume that people from the Rabbanut didn't sit and watch our series, or I actually have a family member who's a Dayan, and I know that they showed them the Get movie, but most of the, the rabbi, rabbis decided that it's not Sanua, you know, that's not modest enough. They didn't watch it. I know that, like, the wife of my family member watched it, and then she said, like, her uh, thought after the movie was like, oh, Shlom Bayit is really important. I don't know how you translate Shlom Bayit, but it's like a family. Peace in the house. Exactly. So if that's like what she thought from the movie, I, I guess she didn't really get the movie. But I do believe that it has a lot of um, effect about the of, uh, about regarding the awareness of uh, of the Israeli society um, about this topic. And as you said, that the fact that people see this as a domestic violence act, um, it, it it has a lot of it has a significant power. And, and I can say that in general, it's a question I ask myself a lot about the power of art in shaping reality. Um, there's days that I'm more optimistic and days that are more, uh, but I think that we, we have like this, you know, obligation to kind of uh, deal with topics we find in, uh, important and, um, and hope that, it, you know, but again, like I was a kid who, or a teenager who watched Mikudesh 20 years ago and, and felt, you know, oh, cinema is actually an amazing tool. So I guess, you know, change is Now start. you're here. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, ho hopefully it can be a tool. And I think as people are watching from home more and more, um, it may allow people who would not normally watch a series, spend some time with it, um, you know, privately and, and reflect. So um, thank you for creating this series and bringing up so many important issues. We've put a lot of resources in the chat for people who are interested in learning more about um, Agunot and what, what can be done around the Jewish divorce process. Um, and for everyone who's asking in the chat how long they have to get through the series, um, who didn't finish binging, if you've started watching already or if you start watching today, you have until Tuesday, it's 48 hours from when you start, when you, when the festival ends that you will be able to continue watching. Um, so uh, get watching and, and you can finish up in the next two days and um, and is the series and there's been some questions also about generally how the series has been received in Israel and where it's been seen internationally if you want to talk briefly about that um, beyond the courts. Uh, sure yeah so it was um, screened at, at, at the Cannes Broadcaster which is like I guess our Israeli PBS it's a wonderful um, broadcaster they have really great content and I, I actually was surprised by its uh, reception. It was, uh, I, I feel that, you know, on one hand, it's pretty pro popular to have these um, series that have uh, religious themes to it, but I also feel that people are uh, getting tired of it in Israel. Um, but I, I felt that, it, you know, that people had patience to it and it, we had also a diverse um, 
uh, audience, people also from religious world, but people that also had nothing to do with it at all. Um, I can't really elaborate about, you know, watching it in the U.S. and other places. I can say that there are, um, there might be um, possibilities in in America to watch it, and also in, in other countries. But it's still like in a negotiation. I think also, in a way, the COVID kind of stopped a lot of these processes, and now things are going back into action. Mm-hmm. And I'd also say that, that you're more than welcome to write me privately uh, on Facebook or whatever if you have any further questions or remark, uh, remarks. I'm actually pretty curious to hear about how people outside of Israel um, saw this this series. And um, yeah, so feel feel free. Yeah, and I, there there are still so many really wonderful questions and comments coming in and, and I wish we had time to, to share them all. So we will definitely pass those on to you. Um, and Abigail, what are you working on now? Are you working on music, on uh, film? Oh, I'm actually releasing my fourth album next month, so that's nice. And uh, a few short movies I've been um, filming lately. <laughs> Lisa, is there anything else that you want to share about um, your work with with Agunot that um, we can share with the audience? I'd say I think we've shared in the chat the contact details for the Boston Agunot uh, Task Force. We have a website called getyourget.com where people can pose <laughs> questions. Um, so you, you're welcome to do that, um, both in the Boston area and around the world. Um, and we also have a program of providing accompaniment to women in the rabbinical courts. And we are we're having our first um, information session for a new hook cohort uh, that we're beginning to train tomorrow. So if you want to reach out to me, I can uh, give you the details of that and you can join us. Thanks. And there's just one more question in the chat about how we can access Abigail's music. So do you want to share that? <laughs> Um, on, on everything, it's called Kovari, my last name. You could see it on Spotify or iTunes or whatever you listen, however you listen to. <laughs> Thank I you. wanted actually to encourage people because she does she has great music and great also video clips. I think your name is in Hebrew, right? On YouTube with the, the video clips or not? Uh, no, actually. Yeah. So you should but check it uh, out. the okay. series were nice enough that they like, uh, they put a few of my songs <laughs> in, in all kind of episodes. Oh, nice. It surprised me. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. Well, thank you all for joining us today and Tamara, Lisa, and Abigail. Thank you for this series and for sharing um, your motivations behind it and Lisa, your your wisdom and deep knowledge of the topic. Um, thank you again to the Schusterman Center for Israel Studies and to Hadassah Brandeis Institute. And we hope to see you all at 1.30 for the conversation with Eitan Fox about sublet and enjoy the rest of your binge if you haven't finished yet. Have a good day and a good afternoon. Bye. Bye. Bye.